When I was hiking the Grand Canyon, uh, it was probably 2016 in November, I was having the best hike. I was alone. I love hiking alone. I love it when people don't bother me. When I'm in the car, I love it when I'm driving just by myself. I get some time to think. No one's pushing their car close up behind me. I just love space. And I remember hiking at the Grand Canyon in November and there really just wasn't anybody around. I didn't see a single person and I loved it. And in fact, I remember I went to what's called Indian Garden. It's a rest area. I was sitting there and there was just nobody. Normally that's a very crowded spot and there was nobody there except for this really fat raven that just sat down next to me and I turned to the raven. I was like, isn't this awesome? It's just you and me. <laughs> the raven didn't say a thing, you know, so it was, I was probably, I, I needed some water at that point. <laughs> and I went up the hike. Um, it's the steep switchbacks on the south rim on the Bright Angel Trail uh, and it was getting dark. That was the time that the supermoon was coming out and it was, just, it was just gorgeous, it was beautiful. And I was getting towards the end. It was just dark enough, but just light enough to see a little bit of the trail. I was right at the end. And I remember looking back and thinking, oh, look what I did. I hiked through all of this. This is incredible. And I looked down at the trail. And remember, I thought this whole time I was alone. But I looked down at the trail and way down towards the bottom, you know, close to the Colorado River, I could see these little tiny lights moving up the switchbacks. And for the first time, I realized I wasn't alone on that trail. And for some reason, something about that scene just really just seared itself into my mind. I remember feeling like the, the sacred wind or something just went into my mind and said, remember this. This is very important. And I had no idea why. Well, about a month later, my daughter was born. She was our, our first child. Her name's Shannon. And she was born on the darkest day of the year, on December 21st. You prepare for parenthood. You have no idea what it is, what it's going to be like, you know. And you can't even believe that they're going to give you this tiny, frail human child without any sort of training. She's going to walk out with it like, like it's the most expensive hamster ever and you're supposed to take care of this. And I, I was so nervous. I remember, you know, Shannon was born. They, they handed her to my, my wife. My wife held her and then they took her and they put her on the little incubator to measure and put all the little tags and you know, collars and whistles and all, all sorts of things on her. And then it came my turn to hold her. And I remember I was so nervous because I have never held something that small before. You know, like little babies are like origami. And I was like, oh, I'm going to break this. I am, I'm going to break this. And our nurse, her name was Frances, she said, OK, Seth, you know, now you get to hold your child for the first time. And I said, OK, Frances, uh, quick question. How, how do I hold uh, uh, her? And she said, what do you mean? You just hold her. And I said, I know. but." Let's pretend I've never held a baby before. How do you hold? How do you pick her up? How do you, how do you hold her? And she looked at me and she was just like this, this like stupefied look. She just said, well, you, you, you put one hand underneath the child and then you put another hand underneath the child and then you lift her up toward you. And I was like, okay. And I'm over there taking copious notes. Okay, <laughs> one hand, reach out. Okay, hold her towards me. Okay. She said, yeah, hold her at your heart. And I said, okay. So then I scooped her up. I held her close to me, and that's when her eyes opened up. And suddenly that scene from the Grand Canyon came back to me very vividly. Because in her eyes, I saw these little lights looking up at me. And as I held her close to my heart, I remember thinking, I almost missed this. You see, I'm someone who has struggled with depression throughout my life. I still struggle with depression. And I struggled with suicidal feelings to such a point that when I was about 20, I tried to take my life. It was a very serious attempt. And through a miraculous set of circumstances, my, my dad and my brother actually saved my life. But I struggle telling that story because that's not everybody's story, right? I, I talk about my suicide attempt and the miracles that happened to preserve my life. And then at a, at a presentation, someone will come up to me and say, yeah, but I did everything to save 
my brother, my sister, my mother, my father, and it didn't work. Why? And the truth is, I don't know what to say. But here's, here's what I want to say today. I have struggled with suicide for, for such an extent, and, and, and I have known people who have struggled with suicidal feelings to, to know enough that there is someone in this room right now who is struggling with suicidal feelings. I know, based upon the presentations I've given in the past, that someone in this room is thinking about coming up to me and saying, I don't, I don't know if I want to live anymore. So this presentation's for you. I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to tell you a reason to live. It might not be the reason that you choose, but hopefully what I talk about today will help you find your reason to live. Fyodor Dostoevsky was a famous Russian author. He spent seven years of his life in Siberian prison. And he wrote these beautiful words. He said, the mystery of human existence lies not in just staying alive, but finding something to live for. I have learned over and over again that when life gets really challenging, like Matt Townsend had said, it's that spiritual core, it's that purpose for living that guides us through our darkest hours. Now I'm going to share with you a, a story. It, at first glance, it's going to seem like out of, out of left field, right? This is just the, uh, the story doesn't apply to us, right? But ever since I heard this story in 2014, I have thought about it every day. It has changed the way I look at the world, it's changed the way I look at the country, and it's changed the way I look at people. Because I want to show you, even if you think your life, your existence doesn't matter, I want to promise you, if you're dealing with suicidal feelings, through this story, I want you to see how your life makes a difference. In the 1600s, there was an expedition that was organized to go to the New World. Now, there were a lot of expeditions that went to the New World. And they were all trying to colonize, and, and basically it was a gold rush. They, they were thinking that if we go there, if we settle there, we're going to make a lot of money. Well, one of these expeditions went to New England at the time. That was the, that was the first time it had really been called New England. Nothing else was there. And they built this colony, and after about a year, almost two years, they realized it wasn't going to work. Their supplies were running low. They didn't know how to navigate through this brand new wilderness, and it was terrifying to them. So after about two years, they all decided to go home. And so another ship came into harbor, they loaded everything up, and everyone set sail for England. Everyone except for one man. His name was William Blackston. And William Blackston didn't have anything to go home to. At his time, there was a war, and he had lost a lot of his friends and family. And he didn't feel like he belonged, that there was anything for him to do in England. Essentially, he was a broken-hearted man who just felt like his life didn't matter. And so he decided to stay. And when the captain extended his hand and said, come on, join on this rowboat, we're going to go back to the ship, Blackston turned on his heel and walked into the wilderness to live by himself. Well, four years went by, and another group of settlers came to the New World. And these were pilgrims. Now, they weren't the pilgrims that you and I are probably familiar with from Thanksgiving, but they were, they were of the same faith. They were Puritans. And they settled, they, they, they sailed past a peninsula, settled on the other side of a harbor, and started to build their community. They were looking for a belonging place. They were looking for hope, right? They were refugees. Nobody wanted them. But they held on to this hope, this belief that there was something better in the future. And when they settled and built this community, this land, and started to develop it, they ran into a problem. The water was bad. And a great sickness swept through all of these Puritans and started killing them. Within a few short weeks, all of these hopes and dreams for the future were being decimated as mothers and fathers, brothers, sisters, and children were just dying. 
And you have to put yourself in their shoes, right? Because they think they're doing the right thing. They're doing the only thing they can to move forward. This is the only place that will take them. And they're dying. And so they're looking for some sort of miracle. And when the light goes down from the sun, when its sun sets, one of the men looks out across the harbor at this peninsula in the water, and they see something they, they just didn't expect to see. It was a light in the wilderness, this little light on a peninsula. And it wasn't a campfire, it wasn't a bonfire, it wasn't the Native American fires. It was a light from a home, a little rectangular light. And they realized someone else is here. So they got into their boats. So their last ditch effort to survive. And they sail across the harbor to this peninsula. And they go to this home, this stone hut right here. And it was surrounded by an orchard of apples. Right? Apples aren't indigenous to America. But someone from Europe had planted an apple orchard, had introduced apples to the New World. And they knock on the door and they meet William Blackston, who had been living alone for four years. And without knowing who he is, without knowing what he's done, without knowing how broken he feels, they say, we need your help. We're dying. And somehow you've survived. And we need your help. And that's when the miracle happened. Blackston took a torch, took water, took apples, took food from his garden, and he went across the water to this community of Puritans. About 300 to 400 Puritans, one man, went across and gave them hope. And he said to them, I have more food, I have more water over on my peninsula. Come, settle on my land. And they did. They moved across and settled on his peninsula. Well, that, that settlement became a village. And that village became a town. And that town became a city, a city on a hill, a city we now know today as Boston. I have to pause there, because I need you to understand the implications of this story. Here is a man who felt broken who was burdened, who felt like his life didn't have anything to offer to the world. And when these people came and knocked on the door and said, we need you, he found a reason to live. And when he went across the water and helped them, he actually began what I consider to be the first American act, right? This idea that America is this light to the world, a beacon of hope, a city on a hill. Right? You, you have that image of the torch, of the light, from the Statue of Liberty. And what does it say on her plaque? Give us your tired and your poor and your huddled masses. Blackston may not have thought that he had a lot to offer to the world. But what he did, that simple act of service, of giving everything that he had, to help someone in need. That changed the world. And I tell you that story because so often we're tempted to think, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do for someone who's struggling, for my loved one, for my son, for my daughter, for my brother, my sister, my friend. I don't know what to do. But I promise you, I, I know things don't always work out the way we want them to, but I promise you that what you do and the light you offer, and the acts of service you render, when you do them in love, and that little light makes a difference. It saves lives. And I promise you that if you are struggling with suicidal thoughts, if you feel like your, your life doesn't matter, I promise you it does. And that one day, if you hold that reason for living close to your heart, one day, you will stand at the precipice of the canyon and look back and realize that it was worth it. Moving forward, giving presentations, dealing with kids who are struggling, 
being the parent who stays up late for their child. It's all worth it. Thank you. <laughs>